good evening. We are glad you're here tonight, church family, extended family, and guests. There's something special about a Christmas candlelight service. Uh, this is a service that makes memories. I know because I have some that go way back to when I was small in the church I grew up in and the Christmas candlelight service there. And we're glad you're here to be a part of this one. I invite you to take the next few moments during the prelude to uh, calm your mind and heart and look back to Bethlehem and to the Savior who stepped into our world. Thank you to Noah Heron for providing the sound effects from the manger and the stable in Bethlehem that night 2,000 years ago. Let's bow together. Father, thank you for what we celebrate at Christmas. Lord, guide us never to lose sight of the fact that you sent a Savior when we didn't deserve one, when what we have earned is sin and death, that you sent a Savior that Jesus stepped into our world 2,000 years ago as a child, uh, as an infant, uh, fully God and fully man. And as we marvel and wonder at him this Christmas, I pray, Father, that you would guide us not only to know that he came into our world in Bethlehem, but I pray, Father, that you would guide each of us to be certain and to know that he has come into our hearts today. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. If you would please stand and turn in your hymnals to responsive reading number 108. Responsive reading number 108. I will read the light print. If you will please then join in reading the bold. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night. Then the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you, you will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Please remain standing and turn to hymn number 126.
seated. On the eve of our Christmas celebration, Jesus' birthday, we light all of the candles of the Advent wreath. First, we light the candle for hope because Jesus is our hope. Secondly, we light the candle for peace because Jesus is our hope and peace. Third, we light the candle for joy because Jesus brings joy. Fourth, we light the candle for love because Jesus is love. Finally, we light the center candle. This is the Christ candle. Jesus is born, Jesus has come, and Jesus is our salvation. In the book of Galatians, But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Galatians 4, 4. Let's pray together. God of love and light, thank you for the light of that star 2,000 years ago that guided the shepherds and then the wise men to that holy babe. Lead us now by the light of your love that we also may follow you to new life in him. In celebration of the birthday of our King and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You would please take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 131 hymn number 131 please stand as we sing
Tonight's scripture reading is from Luke 2, 1 through 7. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinus was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who is now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Thank you, Thomas, and I will take up where Thomas left off with verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were sore afraid. And then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept these things and pondered them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. When James Montgomery was six years old, his parents put him in a boarding school, and then they set sail for the West Indies in order to serve as missionaries. And then they both died soon after they reached their destination. By the age of 10, James was writing poetry. At the age of 12, he flunked out of school. At 14, he was working in a bakery by the age of 16, he was roaming the city streets trying to generate some income by selling some of the poems that he had written. Right after that, he landed a job at a newspaper, but just after he started to work, the publisher got into trouble with the government and had to flee the country. And so James stepped in, took over, and began to publish the paper himself. He became a champion for the poor and the oppressed, and he also became a champion for foreign missions to which both his parents had given their lives. Twice he was thrown into prison by the government for his controversial editorials in the paper. But there was no controversy on Christmas Eve of 1816 when in that day's paper as his editorial he published one of his own poems. Thirteen years after James Montgomery died, that poem made its way to a man in another part of the same country. Henry Smart was one of the most well-known composers and musicians of his day. But then through overwork, he ruined his eyesight and he went completely blind. When he heard James Montgomery's poem, Henry Smart composed a tune in his head 
And then he had his daughter to write the notes down on a sheet of paper. And ever since then, the church has been singing the hymn that resulted from James Montgomery's poem and Henry Smart's tune. And you and I just sang it a few moments ago. Angels from the Realms of Glory. It really is fitting that two men who knew hardship, uh, two men who knew what it meant to suffer and to be shut out and to live as outcasts, have given us a cherished hymn about the message that the shepherds received from the angels on that first Christmas night, as Luke describes it. Uh, just as a manger in a stable is about the least likely place where you would expect to find the Savior, shepherds were about the last people on earth that you might choose to receive the first birth announcement. As the angels made that announcement to the shepherds that night, a multitude of the heavenly host appeared across the sky and they sang glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to men on whom his favor rests. The message of the heavens that night was that now with the birth of this baby, with the coming of Christ, it is possible to have peace on earth. There was nothing that they needed anymore in their world. There was nothing they needed anymore in their hearts than peace. From the kings in the palaces to the outcasts out there with the sheep. And now heaven was announcing, here it is. Peace on earth, just go and take a look in that manger. Isaiah said that Jesus would be the prince of peace. The angels announced when he was born, now peace on earth. Jesus said when he walked the earth, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. And there is still tonight nothing we need any more in our hearts and nothing we need any more in our world than peace. And Jesus is still the only answer and the only place to find it. Wouldn't you like to have real peace in the middle of this storm-tossed life? Well, the first message of Christmas that night directly from heaven is, here it is, peace on earth, and it can be yours. And the encounter of the angels and the shepherds tells us a great deal about what it is and how to have it. The first thing the angels said that night was, fear not, or do not be afraid. Uh, so we find out that the peace that Jesus brings us, the peace that he offers you, means the end of fear. Have you ever noticed in the scripture how when anybody gets a glimpse of God, when God reveals himself to anybody, it always scares them to death. They don't run around waving their arms and shouting. They go all to pieces. Uh, Isaiah said, woe is me, for I'm undone. The shepherds apparently were scared to death. Peter told Jesus, go away, Lord, because I'm an unclean man. After the resurrection, the first thing Jesus has to tell everybody that he encounters is peace to you, because apparently every one of them went to pieces. In Revelation, when Christ first appears to John, John says, I fell at his feet like a dead man. There's a reason for that. When you catch a glimpse of God, when he reveals himself to you, you realize how great and holy he is. And you realize how unclean and unworthy and undeserving you are by comparison. Uh, there is good reason to be afraid when you see God as he is and you see yourself as you are before him. But in every one of those cases in the scripture, the message from God is fear not. You're not about to get what you deserve, but you're about to get mercy and peace. The first two words of heaven's Christmas announcement or fear not. You don't have to be afraid any longer of the Lord God, of anybody else, or of anything in this world. 
Because in Christ, in the coming of the Savior, there is the mercy and the peace of God that nothing can touch and that nothing can ever take away once you have it. Now, if you don't have Christ, if you are still outside of him and outside of his salvation, then frankly, you need to be afraid. Be very afraid. But in him, in the peace that he offers, come those two words that every one of us in our world desperately needs to hear. Fear not. That peace that he brings means the end of fear. And then we also see in this picture with the shepherds that it only comes from heaven. Nowhere outside of Jesus is real peace to be found. At the time that Jesus was born, the world was about as close to peace as it ever gets. And that's because Rome had conquered the entire world. Uh, there were no wars going on because Rome had already beaten everybody. They'd already conquered the whole world. Anybody that tried to rise up and rebel was immediately snuffed out. And so Rome was enforcing their peace across the world. But still, hearts were hungry and men were miserable because just the absence of conflict does not bring real peace. The best that the world can do is try to stop the conflict for a while. But that still doesn't solve the unrest and the turmoil and the conflict in the hearts of men. Somebody said one time, oh, Washington, D.C. is just full of peace monuments. That's because we build another one after every big war. It's also been said that peace is that glorious moment when everybody stands around reloading at the same time. That's about the only peace that this world ever has to offer. Tonight, if we could just magically solve every one of our problems, uh, because you came to the candlelight service, if we could just resolve all your difficulties, pay all of your bills, and end all of your conflicts, we would, every one of us, go home with a peace that might, that might last through lunchtime tomorrow. And then we'd all be back right where we started just as unhappy and just as hungry at heart as ever. Because the peace that Christ offers, the only kind that really lasts, only comes from heaven. It only comes from God. And he broke into our world that night in Bethlehem to offer it. And then he broke into the shepherd's world to announce it. It's not an accident that the heavenly host mentions glory to God and peace on earth in the same breath because the glory of God is the only place that real peace on earth will ever come from. The peace that Jesus offers, that God made possible when Jesus, his only begotten son, stepped into the world, it's not just the absence of conflict. It's not just the absence of trouble or of problems. It is his living presence in us and with us. And it satisfies our greatest needs and our deepest longings. It's peace, not instead of conflict. It's peace right in the middle of conflict. Because it's his presence with you and in you. Uh, it's the kind of peace that you can't find anywhere in the world because it only comes from heaven. If you read this passage carefully, you discover as well that the peace of Jesus will not come to everybody. Not everybody will receive it. The last part of verse 14 literally reads, And on earth, peace among men in whom he is well pleased. The only ones who know God's peace, the only ones who receive the peace that Jesus makes possible are the ones in whom God is pleased. Now, if you look back up at verse 10, you notice that the angel says there, I bring good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Uh, the tidings, the news or the announcement is for everybody for all the world, from the lowest to the highest and the richest to the poorest, from the naughtiest to the nicest. 
the fact that it was made to those lowly shepherds out in the field reminds us again that the Savior came for everybody and everybody needs to know the news. The news is for everybody, but the tragedy is that not everybody will come to know the peace that he offers. Not everybody will know the salvation that he came to bring us because not everybody will respond to him. The good tidings that a Savior has come is for everybody. But ultimately, only those people in whom God is well pleased will know his peace. So, how do you become somebody in whom God is well pleased? You receive the gift that he offers in Christ. You do what the shepherds did. You go to Christ in faith and you bow before him. In repentance and in faith, you receive him as Savior and as Lord of your life. In faith, you accept that gift of salvation that he offers, and then you have his peace all through this life and all through eternity to come. Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. The good tidings are for everybody, but not everybody will respond and know the peace. And then we learn from the angels and from the shepherds that the peace that Jesus offers comes when you have the kind of faith that leads to obedience. When the angels departed that night, the shepherds did not look at each other and say, you know, we ought to check into that someday. They didn't look at each other and say, boy, I would love to see him someday before I die. Uh, you know, one of these days I'm going to go find him and get squared away with the Savior. Uh, they didn't look at each other and say, boy, wouldn't it be nice to go? But right now, well, we've got these sheep and we've got this stuff to do and to take care of. Once in a while I hear somebody ask, what happened to the sheep? If the shepherds took off and went to Bethlehem into town to find the manger, what happened to the sheep? Actually, I know the answer to that question. Who cares? We let so many things get in the way of our going to Jesus. Uh, They laid aside everything they had to lay aside. They forgot what they had to forget. And they went and found the Savior. They looked at each other and said, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary, Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. And then when they'd seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them. Today, once you've met him and once you know, once you have the peace that he offers, it is your privilege and your responsibility to follow in the footsteps of the angels and to share the news. And then to follow in the footsteps of the shepherds and go and make widely known what you have discovered about the Savior. Luke tells us that all those who heard it marveled at those things that were told them by the shepherds. The people who heard it were astonished, but apparently that was about all. Dr. Herschel Hobbes says that the event of the ages occurred right under their noses, and apparently they only wondered momentarily and then evidently ignored it. Now, the good tidings of great joy were for them too. Uh, Right in front of them was the peace they hungered for. And they heard the news and did nothing and missed it. By their own choosing, they became part of the group that was to hear the news, hear the tidings, and never know the peace. So in front of us in this passage, there are two kinds of people. There's the group that heard the news and made haste to go to Jesus and found his peace. And then there are those who heard the news and never did get to Jesus and missed it all. A woman once invited the little girl next door to go to church with her to Sunday school on the Sunday before Christmas. And in an effort to prepare her and to explain things before they got there, the lady explained to her that in the Sunday school class, the children would be having a birthday party for Jesus. After Sunday school, she picked her up and she asked the little girl how she liked it. 
And the little girl said, oh, it was a nice party, but Jesus never did show up. For so much of the world and for so many people, Christmas is just a party without the guest of honor. The secret of it all is what the angels announced to the shepherds. The coming of the Savior is the answer to your deepest needs, your greatest desires, your deepest longings. It means that you can have peace. Peace on earth and for all eternity. The kind that Jesus offers. It's the kind of peace that means the end of fear. That only comes from heaven. That won't come to everybody, but only those people who respond to Christ. And peace that comes when you have the kind of faith that leads to obedience. As the shepherds show us, and James Montgomery and Henry Smart tell us in that hymn, come and worship and see for yourself in your own heart, peace on earth. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the peace that comes in Jesus. I pray, Father, that this Christmas in our church, in our community, in our homes and in each one of our hearts that we will know and we'll experience that peace because we have the presence of the one who is the very prince of it. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. As we prepare to light the candles tonight, I'm going to ask you to Stand up, and if you will, we're going to uh, form a circle around the sanctuary, around the outside walls, and across the front. Uh, if you will, try to stand tightly and make room for everybody. Stretch out into the back corners if we need to. And in just a moment after the circle is complete, then we'll be ready to pass the light. of that peace, uh, as beautiful and peaceful a picture as you might see in our world, and one that reminds us of that peace that Jesus brings. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. The light begins with the Christ candle, and we will pass it from one to another now. <clears throat> the whole world was lost in the darkness of sin, the light of the world is Jesus. 
Like sunshine at noonday, his glory shone in. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, tis shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. No darkness have we who in Jesus abide. The light of the world is Jesus. We walk in the light when we follow our guide. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see the light of the world is Jesus. Ye dwellers in darkness with sin-blinded eyes, the light of the world is Jesus. Go wash at his bidding and light will arise. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see the light of the world is Jesus. <clears throat> no need of the sunlight in heaven, we're told. The light of the world is Jesus. The Lamb is the light in the city of gold. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see the light of the world is Jesus.
now if you'll join and say Before you extinguish your candle, I invite you to take just a second, if you haven't already, and squint. And look around the room through eyes that are almost shut at all those little points of light. What a difference it makes when light comes into a dark place. And that's what Christmas is all about. The light came into our dark world in Bethlehem, and we've had the opportunity to live in it and share it ever since. You may extinguish your candle. Let's bow together for our benediction. Father, guide us to know this Christmas, as we never have before, that there's really only one appropriate response to Jesus, to his coming into our world at Bethlehem, his life, his ministry, his sacrificial death, his resurrection, the salvation and the life he offers us today. Father, help us to know that the only appropriate response to that is to offer him all that we are and all that we have. Lord, guide us to do that this Christmas as never before. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.